A new weekly feature in the run-up to elections, Eye on the Elections. This week we're focusing, as you can see, uh, next to me, uh, our uh, interactive touch screen uh, that we are introducing to you as well. We're looking at the emergence of small parties contesting the polls, and there are a myriad of them. For example, there are around 40 in the Western Cape alone. So why the sudden surge of uh, smaller parties are one of the questions we're asking, and I'll be speaking to Angelo Fick, uh, researcher head of ASRI, and he joins us in studio. Uh, so Angelo, it's, it's less than a month to go and uh, now until South Africans go to the polls in what many are saying could be uh, one of the most important elections since democracy. And one of the trends this season is the emergence of these small parties, especially in the Western Cape. A record number of parties have successfully registered overall and we'll be looking at those with Angelo Fick. So, Angela, I know you know these off by heart, uh, but let's highlight some of these parties, about 48, uh, if we look at the overall number. And let's just uh, point to some of them, highlight some of them. The Aboriginal Khoisan, uh, for example, they've said they want power to ensure that the Khoi and the San are included in the debate around land. The African Christian Democratic Party, the ACDP, um, gaining some power in by-elections in the Western Cape earlier this year. So maybe that's one to watch. We'll look at faith-based party uh, parties. The African content movement is, of course, the one that's headed by Claudi Mitswaneng, the previous COO of the SABC. And then we've got uh, the African Independent Congress. Uh, let's find that. It's been around for a while and of course it's benefited as some of these other parties have. Uh, the A's you can see are popular and benefiting perhaps from confused ANC voters. Uh, so there's a similar insignia uh, when it comes to the AIC often near the ANC and that's helped uh, that party become power brokers at a municipal level at least. Then we go to the B's and we see um, coming down the line, uh, Black First, uh, Land First, of course controversially uh, saying recently they did not want white members, a matter that uh, was complained about to the IEC. If we carry on, well here's the Cape Party and it's been in the news recently saying the DA is scared, it's gaining support in the Cape. The DA of course lodged a complaint because uh, the Cape Party didn't display the address of the company responsible for printing its posters. So the little party, the Cape Party, was saying the DA was being petty. Uh, then we go to good and of course that's very important uh, for the Western Cape. Uh, Patricia DeLille's party, let's go past some of these and Angelo uh, you'll of course know uh, good is uh, Patricia DeLille's party, a split in a way from the DA. Now remember the fight between the DA leadership and DeLille left some voters uh, disillusioned. So I want to ask you about that and I guess we only understand the real impact of that in these polls. Uh, let's move on. Let me see if I can find um, the Land Party, uh, specifically focused on land justice. That will be a crucial issue uh, if we carry on. I think we've passed the Green Party, another one uh, coming back, the Green Party of South Africa, uh, seen before. And if we sort of head to the end of the list, I think we'll find uh, there's a Green Party of South Africa and we'll find uh, the Women Forward focusing on the female voters. So, Angelo, a, a question that's being asked is, is this good for democracy, this plethora of new parties in this election, or is this something that could just lead to confusion, to, to split votes? I don't think it's necessarily leading to confusion or split votes. Um, I think there are, you know, not all of those small parties are necessarily the same kinds of parties. So as you've indicated before, some of those parties have been around for 20 odd years. Many of them have very long histories in very specific local politics and political issues. Um, so there are the religious parties that have specific issues. There are members or there are parties on that list who do have members in the National Assembly. Uh, and then there are parties that used to be in the National Assembly, like the Minority Front, who have no longer there. So there is a very mixed bag of experiences there. Then there are a whole series of parties that pop up every election and disappear after monotone 
two elections when they don't get the, the kind of support that they usually expect. Uh, many people who were around in 1994 will remember that there was the Soccer Party, there was KISS, there was the Dacha Party. So these small formations are, I think, hopefuls who want to get into Parliament either on single issues or because they believe they have some sort of fantastic, quixotic role to play in South African politics. Is, is there any sort of trend when it comes to faith-based parties? Um, I've heard informally some churches backing this time the ACDP for various reasons. And, and does that point to maybe the, the morality, uh, the debates around politics right now? So the majority of South Africans profess to have, believe that they are believers in one faith or another. In fact, the vast majority profess to be Christians. Uh, and so there are all sorts of political issues um, that many people see as moral issues, whether it is a question of reproductive rights, whether it is a question of how one deals through the criminal justice system with criminality. Um, these parties often have very specific views on abortion or on you know, the death penalty. And there are people who are believers who share with those parties principled beliefs. And I think ridiculing people for their beliefs is a very, very problematic idea. These parties are not parties that I think we should dismiss. There are parties that represent people's interests. Those interests may contradict and conflict with the Constitution, but it is important for people to feel that they have the right to air those ideas, and it is our duty as citizens to use the Constitution to make sure that those things we believe in as secular beings, secular citizens, do not become law. Can, can you get votes if you have a very narrow focus? Uh, one party, I think, looking specifically at the Gaza issue, uh, or the Green Party, for instance. <coughs> Pardon me. No um, I think the Gaza party is far too narrow a focus, um, and there are several parties like that. There are, however, also parties that do have a narrow focus, but don't kind of get stuck in them. <coughs> Pardon me. <laughs> We can, get you, we, can, we can get no, you some water coffee. as well. I'll get back on, on, on the horse. Um, so there are parties with very narrow foci um, that are so narrow that you can't actually translate that into civic action or political belief. Mm. However, a party like the National Freedom Party went from being a very specific local party fighting local politics, some place like the Bushbuck Residents Association got into national politics because they took a very specific narrow issue, which is service delivery issue, at the very local level and were able to maneuver themselves into the national space. However, they fared less well in provincial and nat national legislatures because once you catapult out of the specific local in the ward or in the municipality and you get into the province or into the larger metro council, you begin to water down because now you have to sit on various committees, you have to decide. Your issue becomes subservient to the larger party's agendas. And that's simply a matter of numbers and of the ways in which committees work. And so I think it is important to recognize that there are principled reasons people may support a small party, whether it's religious or whether it is something like the Green Party, um, and something else altogether where it is such a narrow issue that you will not have broad appeal and many voters will look at your party and go, well, what do you have to say about these other issues? So, so Suzanne Boyson wrote a piece saying uh, the multitude of small political parties has gotten out of hand, basically. It's not about multi-party democracy anymore, uh, but there's this risk of turning this democracy into a caricature of opportunism and low-level grabs. So you disagree? Well, I disagree with her somewhat. I agree with her in that for many people in these political parties that get started up, it's a way to try and get into office. And they promise that once they're in office, they'll be able to revolutionize the system. When actually once they're in office, they too will get 1.2 million if they're sitting inside the National Assembly or, you know, its equivalent should they get into the provincial parliament. Um, and that's not necessarily, you know, what the politics of South Africa aims to do. The political landscape, the architecture is to get a multiplicity of voices, but it's also incumbent on voters to be critically literate citizens and figure out which parties actually have a platform that will be in opposition and which parties have platforms that are opportunistic. And that, I think, is one of the signal choices that voters have in front of them. This is not to say that any time a party doesn't get supporters, it is illegitimate, or that parties that have single platforms and get supporters are somehow illegitimate. This is also, I think, disingenuous. So I agree with Susan that there is opportunism. But I disagree with her that this is simply that there are too many parties. Mm. Most of those parties exist as vanity projects for the people who start and support them. They never get into parliament, 
either at provincial or at national level, and they simply don't garner enough votes for us to take them seriously as political players who have an influence on elected politics. Mm -hmm. However, those small parties who do get in, whether it's in a municipality, which doesn't count in this election, or in a province or in, a, you know, in the National Assembly, those parties have very important roles to play. They may be single-issue parties that if the politicians in them play well inside the party, inside the National Assembly Committee system, can be the gadfly. Let's not forget, it was a member of a very small party, the Independent Democrats, Patricia de Lille, who was able to niggle at the political system in South Africa before she joined the DA in order to pursue, out of the PAC into the ID, the arms scandal. So I think we have to talk about good, but, but first, will you really address that fear? Because there is a fear that there won't then be a strong opposition, maybe to hold a government to account. You need a strong opposition, and, and these smaller parties could split the votes. Is, is that a concern for us where we are right now? It's not a concern for me. It is a concern for a whole series of people in the political landscape in South Africa who believe that, you know, it's seemingly that South African voters should put its, for them, it's, it sounds to me as if they see South Africa's electoral system like a horse race. It's pointless backing the horse that you know is going to come in seventh. You should be backing one of the top three. I think politics does not work that way. People have principled beliefs that guide some of their political behavior, and we should laud that because so much of politics is no longer about principles in this country. So if somebody supports a small party in principle because they share that party's you know, platform in terms of beliefs and ideas, I have respect for them, rather than the person who thinks that they're going to vote strategically, which means they're going to vote for somebody that they don't really believe in, but they believe that person should do or that party should do X, Y, or Z in relation to the party they really support but thinks is behaving badly. I think that's highly irrational kind of behavior. People who support a party for political reasons because they believe in the party's platform, even when I disagree with them, are at least voting for somebody that they can then hold to account because they're an active supporter of that party's platform, whether it's religious, whether it's ethical, whether it's single issue. I think people who vote strategically are playing a game, assuming that millions of other people are going to play similar games, and it's a bit like playing the lotto. You hope you're going to win, but at some level you also yeah. know that's not necessarily going to happen. I interesting view. And this is so important for the Western Cape because the DA maybe has lost uh, a, lot of, a lot of ground because of the DeLille saga. Uh, the ANC, many are asking, is it strong enough to sort of step into that gap? Maybe uh, some of these small parties will come forward. Let's start with, to what extent do you think that the fight between Patricia DeLille and the DA has sort of loosened uh, the DA's grip on power? in the Cape. So the fight between Patricia de Lille and the DA when she was a member of the Democratic Alliance is now in the past. Patricia de Lille has launched a whole series of new fights against the DA um, in public domains um, that speak to questions around DA governance and its so-called commitment to clean governance and to you know, upholding the rule of law. Many of her detractors and critics inside the DA are saying she has questions that she has still left unanswered. So that fight inside the DA is now between it's good and the over. DA, um, but it's still an internal fight um, because it's about the same principles and people calling one another hypocrites. Brett Heron has also gone on social media and, you know, kind of attacked the DA for all sorts of things, suggesting that, you know, people appearing at a railway station and pretending that this is the first time they hear that metro rail services don't work in the city mm -hmm. are disingenuous. Those kinds of attacks, you know, are continuous. I think it is election season. People are going to behave in this way. What Patricia de Lille, I think, is counting on is that people disaffected with the DA will vote for her, that people who remember her from her independent Democrat days will vote for her, and that there'll be a certain amount of support for her as somebody who stands up as a kind of David figure in the face of the DA's Goliath persona in the Western Cape. Whether that works or not is a slightly different story because the Democratic Alliance in the Western Cape calls on its own record in governance, just like the ANC does nationally, and has its own good story to tell. Whether that convinces millions of voters in the Western Cape is a very different story. Chances are it will go well for the DA in the Western Cape. I cannot see how you know, an ANC in disarray will sweep that away from them. But again, you know, one cannot predict voter behaviours in the ways that people imagine that you can. In polls, people will tell you one thing, Inside that little booth, people do very, very different things often. Okay, so your thumb stuck. Will good make inroads? Will, will she make inroads? I think good will make, will have an impact on Western Cape politics. It will probably take 
a stanch of voters away from the Democratic Alliance. I'm not so certain that it is enough to topple the DA out of power on its own, nor do I think good is necessarily going to be well served to enter coalitions with parties that have very tainted records simply because it's a matter of convenience for, um, you know, to keep the DA out of power. The independent Democrats had the problems that they did with the DA precisely by being merged in. Having, an in, having coalition politics in the Western Cape might be good for the Western Cape, it might be good for both of the two big parties, the ANC and the DA, because it would wake them up to have to start serving the citizens more broadly rather than their niche individual sort of so-called markets. Because some people were looking at the, the fact that the DA in, in a by-election earlier this year lost a lot of support in Bonte, Heerville, Valhalla, uh, saying, you know, that that's crucial, the Cape Flats for the DA. But, but can you really read uh, a lot into isolated by-elections? See, I wouldn't extrapolate from individual by-elections, but I do think it should alarm the DA that its traditional constituencies in those you know, areas of the Western Cape, particularly of the Cape Flats, seem to be moving away from it. Um, if we're looking at the older you know, townships like Langa and Nayanga and Guguletu, they've traditionally remained ANC because there's a very long-standing tradition of ANC politics. There will even be some PAC voters sitting inside Langa um, who will be loyal voters and not out of some blind sense of loyalty but because of a principled commitment to the politics of the party they vote for. The Democratic Alliance has really benefited in the Western Cape from the old policies of the coloured labour preference policy policy and the kind of divide and rule of the National Party. Um, but in the last 10 years, many people in those spaces have felt more and more disillusioned because it's not just South Africa that has grown more unequal. The Western Cape has grown more unequal as South Africa has. And people have indicated that they feel left out. And it hasn't helped that the DA's internal policy and its municipal politics has been so perceived to be so anti-poor in the city bowl, has seen you know, all sorts of concerns around the Kailicha by the sea phenomenon that one councillor was accused of recently saying. The idea of having a kind of insider-outsider in the DA, that is something that is playing out at the national political level in the party, but also particularly in the Western Cape. If, if we look at those by-elections as well, the ACDP uh, increasing its support in, in some areas in the Western Cape. Is that one to watch? I think many people at the local level vote for what the councillor tells them they're going to do and if the previous councillor didn't actually do it they will vote for somebody else or they'll change their vote. Um, in the national political landscape I think it's slightly different. Different factors will play in. So many people might vote in a by-election for the ACDP in a ward in a municipal election and are unlikely to vote for such a party at the national level. And we see that in the discrepancies that parties get between provincial, uh, sorry, between local election, municipal elections and national elections. You see this, for example, in the EFF. You may poll very well in, you know, the national election at 6%, but in certain spaces in the country, you poll lower. And then in the national election, you might poll 6% if you're in the EFF, um, in the general election, and then in some parts of the country, in the municipal election, you score much higher and you become the official opposition. So those kinds of shifts where people are voting differently in the two kinds of elections needs to be borne in mind. In terms of what is going on inside the Western Cape, I think it is one of the more interesting provinces to watch because electoral behaviour this time round in 2019 is likely to demonstrate a potential political future that one can see for the other provinces, just like the 2016 municipal elections demonstrated that voters could see somebody other than the ANC in political power. We, we've unfortunately run out of time. This is so fascinating. Maybe let's end with, you, you keep on talking about a principled politics uh, and these small parties, some of them standing for certain things. Do you think mor morality in, in a way will mark this election and maybe because of some of the, the very serious claims currently being leveled against ANC leaders? And not just the ANC. Some of those claims are being leveled against, you know, people in the Democratic Alliance and the Economic Freedom Front. So for many voters, the kind of immorality that they perceive in the dominant parties may be driving some of their choices towards other options. 
Um, and here, people who profess to have religious belief may now cleave unto those religious beliefs, even though they're not monolithic. So people who, for example, identify as Muslim or identify as Christian, don't necessarily agree with all the things that these so-called Muslim or professed Muslim and Christian parties say they're about, but may find some home there should they feel disillusioned about other options. But let's not forget, not all small parties are in the same kind of section of the Venn diagram. Some of them have longer histories, some of them are in indeed, as Susan Boyson points out, opportunistic, and others are new and kind of new arrivals who want to address what they see as gaps in the political landscape, whether it is about workers' rights, poor people's rights, the idea of you know the environment and the Anthropocene that we live in. I think it is important for voters and for all analysts for us to think more critically about these parties may have smallness in common, but they have very different kinds of trajectories. All right, thank you. Uh, the fascinating politics of small parties. That was Angelo Fick, a director of research at Uval Socioeconomic Research Institute, ASRI. And uh, that's it. Uh, that was our new weekly feature, Eye on the Election.